Mr. Dai, thank you so much for joining me. You've been writing a lot about uh, change in the information technology sector. I noticed that in the month of June, you wrote three articles uh, which focused on what had essentially gone wrong and perhaps to some extent what could be done to fix it. And what we're talking about, and let me use the illustration of some views from outside. So, for example, let's say uh, uh, stock brokerage like J.P. Morgan or Jefferies. Uh, both of them, uh, a few months ago, said uh, or rather put an underweight tagging on uh, IT companies. Uh, and when usually when they talk about IT companies, they talk, talk about TCS, they talk about uh, Infosys, Wipro, uh, HCL and Tech Mahindra, and HCL being your own alma mater. Similarly, uh, you know, they in within that, these brokerages would have talked about the drag on revenue growth, uh, the problem with a higher exposure to consulting services, the challenges of uh, moderation in global IT spending, and that's something that we'll come to as well, and some very specific issues which might be due to do with clients. So this is the most specific problem uh, to do with how things are looking in the next three to six months as brokerages are seeing. But, you, but what you've been saying is something more fundamental and is to do with whether or not IT companies or the IT sector is prepared for the big shifts that are happening, uh, including through AI, and where they've perhaps gone wrong in the way they've either not prepared or the kind of hiring they've done or the bench uh, that they've built. So uh, why don't I let you start off with uh, where you think we are in, in Indian IT and what's gone wrong before we come to what can be said right. Thanks, thanks, Govind, for inviting me. Uh, if you look at the genesis of, genesis of Indian IT, uh, actually the takeoff happened in Y2K time. Uh, in year 2000, uh, where Indian IT was the answer to a large pool of people which were needed to be able to fix the potential Y2K uh, problem. And that is how Indian IT had a, I call a hockey stick growth. Then came the 2008 recession. Uh, the 2008 recession put a significant cost uh, drag on a lot of customers. And Indian IT, given the fact that they had matured in the last eight years with offshore services and CMM level 5 factories and idle factories became an answer to that problem and because of which the uh, global IT companies saw a down stick whereas Indian IT companies gained market share during that phase. Uh, if you take the COVID time, exactly the same thing happened predominantly because work from home and offshoring took a big sweep up and everybody was cutting cost. Indian IT was the answer to that problem. When we come now, uh, we see a dichotomy in, number one, what the global banks are saying, for example, or global customers are saying. You take Citibank, you take JP Morgan, you take Bank of America. I'm talking about the customers, not the brokerage houses. Sure. And all of us are they saying they're doubling down on investments in digital. And their IT spends are only going to increase because that is exactly what is happening in their business. They are moving away from uh, what we call physical uh, services to more digital services, and they're competing on that landscape. Uh, so on one side, we hear that kind of a vo vocabulary. On the other side, we hear a vocabulary that Indian IT is facing a significant slowdown. So the first question which comes to my mind is, are we wrong-footed in the solutions and services we are offering? Uh, predominantly because every time there was a crisis in the market, Indian IT gained market share. Uh, now there is a crisis in the market and people are taking money off the legacy and investing in digital and we are facing the pain. Does that mean that we are wrong footed? Does that mean we let the margins, we release the margins rather than invest the margins during COVID times? Uh, are we as ready as digital like other companies are? So those are the concerns which are coming in my mind in question number one, are we wrong footed? The second thing is that Indian IT fundamentally is based on its employees, right? It's based on its people, its processes, and its products. Uh, the people part of it, you know, I'm, I've seen a lot of announcements which are like the, white, the, the new startup announcements. That, you know, unfortunately, we have a lot of these celebrated startups which are sacking people like bananas. Indian IT seems to be, despite the fact that they have very large balance sheet, are forgetting that for such large companies, uh, reputations are very important. Their ability to attract talent is very important. I was in IIT Bombay. I was a uh, convocation speaker there. And I was asking, how many of you guys are joining in the IT? And you know, the, the answer was very different to the answer it used to be. 
So the question is, if you do not attract the best, how will you build the products of the future? How do you build capabilities of the future? And why are you not attracting the best is predominantly because this knee-jerk reaction policies of getting red and, you know, utilization dominating quarter and quarter margins being important. They are important, but I think we are in a cycle where investment in new products, new platforms, new services, new digital, new capabilities is very critical. Therefore, we, have, we should have the ability of attracting the best. So on those two counts, I believe that I'm a little concerned about where Indian IT is going. Having said that, Indian IT has always emerged from these scenarios. So all the listeners, especially people who wish to join Indian IT, uh, I am an insider and therefore concerned. But if you are an outsider, don't be concerned because Indian IT always finds a way around. We, we criticize ourselves internally, but we'll always find a way around. And I'm sure the leadership of Indian IT will find a way around. And and I can uh, testify that to that having being part of so many uh, NASCOM fora over the years, where I have seen you know the the quest, dire questions being asked, and uh, you know the solutions somehow being found by the year that uh, followed. No, so I just come back to banks. I mean, you did you did talk about how uh, you know banks in an, in an article that you wrote that the top ten U.S. banks increased their investment in technology by twelve to sixteen percent. So if we can uh, build on that a little bit and then uh, connect it to the point that you made about people not being there. So either we've hired too much, but we've not hired the right people. And those we want to hire, we are just not finding. So it seems to be a conundrum of out of which there is no way out. Yeah. So you, you, you have to go back a little and think when the industrialization happened, what really happened is that processes and back office automation became very, very important. So we automated everything so that banks and all our customers are more efficient and more effective, more responsive. Uh, and therefore, the back office became SAP, Oracle. You know, all these back office applications, banking, automation software came. And Indian IT came up with the fact that they became extremely good in what we call the back office development, back office maintenance, infrastructure maintenance, and the business process outsourcing around the back office. Now, with digitalization coming in, the back office has become less relevant. The front office has become very relevant. The customer experience. So you join into, go into Access Bank or ICC Bank, you get a different kind of experience. And people are choosing banks based on the mobile app experience they have with the bank rather than the balance sheet of the bank, you know, all those. So therefore, the banks are digitalizing themselves to move away from what we call standardization, commoditization to personalization. Now, that whole move of standardization to personalization is what we call the digital move. All that development is not happening offshore. All that development starts with what we call, uh, you know, a, a fast development on a digital innovation lab, which, has, which is largely on customer premise or in a near shore center. So, therefore, if you want to attract, get into that market, you need a couple of things. Number, we, number one, you need feet on the street where the customer is, right? Number two, you need consulting capabilities where the customer is so that you can navigate the customers to work left and right. And number three, you need talent who has been able to, only in the last five years, understand these technologies, absorb this technology, apply this technology so that he or she can consult to the customers. And that needs a fast track growth of capability, which did not exist five years ago. Now, all that you have to do near shore, and then only the product, the services will start moving offshore. And to be able to do that, because if you don't have enough people, you need a product, you need a platform. And you should have invested in a product and platform to be able to do it without people or with lower skilled people. Now, when you look at the way Indian IT has been hiring, obviously they have been hiring onshore you know, at a, at a good rate. But we need to hire exactly like we hire from IITs. We need to hire from the best institutes of the world to be able to build those products and platforms. And I'm very happy to see CEOs move onshore. I think the chief delivery officers and chief technology officers should also move offshore because there is where the market is right now and the tail will come to India automatically. So this whole emphasis on hiring from campus and you know large numbers and things like that is reflecting the massive cash business, which is the legacy business. And it's a very attractive business and very difficult for us to move away from it. And it will go through ups and downs, and therefore you will hire and you will not hire. I hope you don't fire, but you will delay hiring. And I hope you don't change the salary which you offer to the freshers. These are all not ethical practices. 
But there, that is not where the real story is. The real story is what you're asking. Who are we hiring? Where are we hiring? How are we accelerating their capability building? And are they relevant for tomorrow? That answer I don't have. And that answer, if I look, correlate with revenues, I, I, I would say that is still working properly. So what is wrong with legacy, uh, having legacy skills at least at this point? So I, I mean, we'll come back to the point about digitalization, which uh, uh, has been going through its own journey for about three to four years. And uh, I'm going to build on that a little bit. But what's wrong with legacy? You have to remember there were there used to be a company called EDS, uh, you know, and HP and IBM and Dell. And they were the big dads of services economy. And in came Indian IT with a new offering called the offshoring, CMM level 5, automation, and therefore the entire legacy business moved lock, stock, and barrel. And the customer said that because cost is important, dear EDS, you're no, no more relevant. These Indian IT companies like TCS and all those are a lot more relevant, the business moved. So the question is, legacy is a very attractive business. And the reason you know those companies did not move is because the total IT outsourcing at that time was a very attractive business with 20%, 30% net margin. And therefore, they said, why should we attempt to go to India? Why should we attempt to do offshoring? We are already making 20, 30%. This included IPM. Now, when Indian IT company came in and they started taking all these outsourcing contracts away, including HCL, uh, when we started taking all these contracts away, they woke up, but they woke up too late. What happened? Indian IT became more relevant for the customer and they became less relevant for the customer. The question is, legacy is a very attractive business. We are making the same statement. It is 20% net margin. It is growing at, at teens, you know, 10%, 12%, 13%. Uh, we can deploy tons and tons of people. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. But see where the market is going. See what happened to EDS should not happen to you. See the fact that you are continue to be relevant and continue to talk to the CEO, continue to be in the boardroom. Yes, digital will continue to be only 5-10% of the customer's revenue, but you will be relevant for the customers. That is what relationships are all about. You don't want to be a back office uh, vendor. Uh, when somebody else becomes a front office vendor, you lose relevance and they build an offshore capability. And then, you know, exactly what we did to global IT companies, they did to us. So that is the reason digital is very important, not from margin, or revenue perspective, it is very important from relevance point of view. And customer relationship, privileged access, you know, all what Indian IT is damn good at will come from you being relevant to their pain areas. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, customer access, uh, I was reminded of this piece you wrote where you uh, promised to meet a client the next morning in New York uh, on virtually, but landed up physically. Yeah, so... Uh, I, I think there are many stories like that in Indian IT because uh, customer has to see you hungry, capable, passionate for his or her solution. So this customer was in New York. She had given the order to somebody else. We were desperate for that order. So I decided that uh, she says, uh, I will give you a reason why you lost the order. I set up a phone call with her, but instead of on a phone call, I took a flight in the night, landed in New York, and was in front of her. Uh, and she says, why did you come? I said, you know, on on just one phone call, if I can take flight across the Atlantic and be here, imagine what we can do as a company for you. Now, that single sentence convinced her. Uh, the reason I'm saying is she, she gave that statement to Bloomberg, one of the articles in Bloomberg, giving the reason that she gave that order to HCL is because of the flight. So the point is that if you really want to win in this competitive uh, you know, world, you need the passion, you need the perseverance, you need the aggression, you need the products, you need the services, you need the relevance. You need to be very, very hungry, very, very hungry. Otherwise, what happened to them can happen to you. Digitalization is a good target to have. It's an aspiration, but I'm assuming that it's not that easy to achieve, you know, uh, Wipro said recently that they were launching on a massive program to, you know, equip everyone with AI. There have been similar programs run by people like Accenture, and I'm sure all IT companies to equip them with the world of digital and cyber and everything else. So, are you saying that all of that is not happening, or there's not enough of it happening, or a more fundamental question: Are the people are just not ready or even equipped to take all this training and convert it into something big? 
So I'll be very unpopular for saying this. You know, there is a verbose and there is a reality. Uh, a lot of revenues got re-Christianed as digital revenues, right? Uh, and because of which, we potentially see everybody being extremely good in digital. Uh, but when you see what are the actions people have taken, how many of these companies have created specific digital division? So when, what is our, how did Indian IT grow? Indian IT grew, started with software, then there was a new division for BPO, then there's a new division for remote infrastructure management, which, you know, Comnet created. Uh, then there is a new division for engineering services. Then there is a new division for enterprise software services. Every time we grew the Indian IT based on creating completely new division and new service line. Uh, so how many companies have a completely different division for digital? Point number one. Number two, what are the kind of intellectual property uh, applications which Indian IT has put in compared to, let's compare Accenture versus you know some of the others and saying what are the kind of applications which have been put in. What kind of products have we announced? What kind of product platforms have we announced? Because tomorrow, everything is going to be around plat platforms and not about people in capability. This is what AI and ML is. So I think we have to think differently. Yes, the legacy business has to be thought exactly the way we thought before, but the digital business has to be thought differently. The legacy business will also see a digital, you know, some of my colleagues in the industry are absolutely right that they're going to use AI, ML to be more productive. The service cost will go down. If we need 10 people, we'll need two people. All that stuff is going to happen, definitely going to happen. And that efficiency and effectiveness, I think Indian IT is past masters at it. And they're going to squeeze the juice out of it. And they continue to be relevant or relevant uh, on, on legacy. But my argument is legacy is not going to be relevant. Right? The relevance is shifting. And to be relevant for that, what is relevant for the customer, which is not necessarily just cost, but his market share, is relevant. Most of these banks are struggling to be relevant to the customers. So there is where you need to move. And to be able to move that, the matrix for you is completely different. Now, how you go about doing it, you have, you know, I don't want to name, but some of the global IT companies, digital revenues, digital products, is completely different to our, our profile. Their percentages are completely changing. So I would say it needs more energy. It needs more intent. We need to get afraid of the future. We need to get afraid of what's going to happen to us in the future. And that will get the best uh, of the Indian IT. And once again, I say, I'm dead sure Indian IT will get it right. It's just the fact that we need to, you know, do that share I share I <laughs> think to ourselves. Because that is what I'm afraid of. If Indian, what happened to BPO? It's all all gone, right? Largely, Indian IT has lost BPO, predominantly because we did not innovate. We were continuing to run BPO exactly the way we were running with efficiency, cost. You know, did you say we lost it? We lost it to you mean Philippines, Philippines, Vietnam, to to all the other countries. How did these countries get created? Why did we not go to Nagpur and Trivandrum and all these places? Predominantly because we saw it as a cost play. We saw it as uh, as per, per hour cost. No, this was a business process. We should have put business consultants. We should have automated. We should have created platforms, which is what people like Accenture did. They created platforms, and on that platform, they had a unique access, and therefore they were yeah, they were winning those deals completely to the back. So I think that we we have to learn those lessons, and we have to be a lot more alert on this move from back office to front office. And this move is only going to accelerate. And this move is not a revenue move. It is not a profit move. It is a relevance move. So, you know, to come back to people, uh, which since that will be the uh, the core of all of this, uh, you know, you wrote uh, perhaps uh, 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 at a time where you were not feeling very charitable. You said IT companies now hire school pass out children and train them on these skills in just three months, giving them the advantage of lower costs and lower attritions. What they now seek from universities and engineering colleges are advanced digital skills, which are difficult to teach in six months. So, obviously, it's difficult to teach in six months, but these are the people that you have in your organization. So, how, I mean, I'm sure many transitions are happening, but the larger problem seems to be unaddressed. Uh, yeah, I think, so, We I wrote that article from, you know, waking up the education system in the fact that you are wrong step. Uh you know, at one particular time, engineering used to be a large supply pool for Indian IT. Indian IT is going down the tube, 
and their legacy recruitment is school pass out. And therefore, if you are not careful, your engineering colleges will close down, which is exactly what is happening. So I the wrote the article which I wrote was for in for Indian education system and engineering colleges to wake up to become more relevant. But from an Indian IT point of view, I would challenge you to ask how many people, how many of the top five IITs, what percentage of students go into Indian IT? So the talent is there. When the talent is there, you know, <laughs> we have to we have to go, we have to have the guts to play competitive and get them. So it is either the price we pay or it is it is the job opportunity we offer or the platform to create products we offer. The talent is in India. Why do we allow that talent to go somewhere else? Look at day zero companies in the top five IITs or IIMs for that matter, right? Why are we not in day zero? We were once day zero companies. So what will it take for us to go there? Right? Will it need us to create a product division? Will it need up our salary? So the talent is there. From an Indian IT point of view, if you keep crying that the talent is not there, they are not trained, they are not digital, of course you are in tier two colleges and you still pay that three, four lakhs per annum. Of course, what, what are you going to get? But if you can't hire a thousand IIT engineers, right, at 40 lakhs a piece, by 40 lakhs per person, why would you not do that? You will not do that because if you don't have a vision, which is product, platform, you know, you, you, you need to have a bold vision. You have such great balance sheet. You know, you have such great cash. Why would you not take a $100 million bet and get the best and brightest from these IITs and IMs and create a division which is so compelling that it's going to challenge every single company in the world? Why should they go to McKinsey's and Bain's of the world? They should yeah. come and work in Indian IIT. So I suspect you know the answer to this as well. So why, why, why don't you answer that? I, it is not for me to answer that, Govind. What would you have done? I mean, at this point of time, I mean, this all this entire world is not too far from you, uh, chronologically speaking. No, I, I, I would not. So, I because I, the moment you hired those people and, and large numbers at such high salaries that you're saying almost 10 times, uh, you know, by next quarter, you're going to be, or the quarter after that, you'll be facing investors. I, I would say that Indian IT, with the market caps they have and the margins they have, are capable of attracting investors who are long-term oriented. Uh, they must understand investors have an opportunity of going in and out in a quarter. Indian IT doesn't have that opportunity of going in and out. So the boards of Indian IT and the CEOs of Indian IT have to think long-term. And we have lost few battles and we have won many battles. Indian IT owes Govind, Indian IT owes a lot to India. If this mission of being the third largest or second largest economy is to come true, we need products, we need platforms, we need intellectual property, we need we cannot be the service headquarters of the world. We have to be different. Who is going to take that lead? Government can't take that lead. Indian IT CEOs, Indian IT entrepreneurs have to take that lead. We have to think long term. How did Indian IT get created by FC Kohli's of the world or Nader's or Murthy's or Premji's of the world? Because they thought long term. Nothing existed. They thought long term. They created something completely from scratch. And that time nobody talked about what does the stock market think or the analyst think. These guys were visionary. So why don't we have the same vision now? But except for Kohli, the rest are still around. I mean, maybe not in an executive way, but they're still around. True, true. No, I'm not I'm not picking one of them. I'm saying there are a lot, a lot of younger entrepreneurs, right? They were very young when they started. They started with no cash. Today, there is a lot of cash going in, uh, running around. So it is not just the large company. It is also the smaller company. Where is your ambition? Where are your guts? Indian IT got created from scratch. Now, what are we going to create more? This country needs them. We have that capability. Don't fall for that sugar baby called legacy software with 20% margin and massive cash flow. That, that is going to take this country down. We need to have guts to go against the grain of the quarter by quarter stock market for some time. What are we talking about? See, you, you, if, you're, if your profit you know, is four, five billion, six billion dollars a year, how much is a hundred million dollar dip in that profit? Not much. 
And especially if you can tell a story, HCL told its transformation story, the stock market supported it. You, you supported it because you, you bought into that argument. So I think there is an opportunity here. There is a massive opportunity for our country. There's a massive opportunity for Indian IT. We should stop this uh, infatuation with legacy, believe that it's going to, that, that marriage is going to go away. We have to create something more. It will take five, seven years to create it. We have to put our best and brightest there. We have to hire the best and brightest. The talent war is the biggest war. We should not allow our talent to go anywhere else. Whatever we need to do to support, to buy, bring them in, we should do it. To retain them, we should do it. And we should have open policies. You know, this moonlighting. Why? You know, I, I'm sorry, I can go on and on. Yeah, yeah I've, 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 seen your, uh, I've seen your comments on that subject. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but so what I'm saying is motivation of the employee is critical. If he wants to moonlight in an outside office hours and it is not competing with you and it is not breaking any rule. Why are you preventing it? You know, we have to think, we are not in, we are not in manufacturing, we are not in an industrial age, we are in a digital age. Everybody is free. Nobody is bound. So we have to think, our, our people policy has to be best in the world. Our people policy has to be so emancipated that it's become a competitive edge. Everything which we do has to be a competitive edge. Everything. And that is the way we have been. But wouldn't you want the talented people now that you you made a case for the t uh, you know going or gunning for the the best best in class talent in this country engineering talent and so on? But wouldn't you want them to be focused as well and, uh, and or uh, as opposed to doing multiple things and grappling with one project in the morning and one project at night? Yeah, I mean not that there are too many of them, but just as a, a more hypothetical question. Yeah, very clearly, creating platforms, not products, creating platforms which are industry specific, which are using machine learning in a way the world has not seen before. So they are embedded as a separate division or you know, separate team, which taps into the information we have on every vertical, and we have a lot, starts working on creating platforms, which will bypass all this uh, custom build of digital solutions, and will take us, you know, exactly how India went, bypassed the mainframe age and went into Unix, multiprocessor Unix, and we completely bypassed the mainframe age and became, you know, world beater on capability of developing operating system is the way we need to do that. So they need to move and create something which is going to be very relevant five years from now. So they so need to be in that. Yeah, so, and, and I'll come to, my, as, as I ask you my last few questions, but, uh, you know, Indian IT has faced many challenges and that too is very well documented uh, and people talk about it. So uh, you mentioned some of them yourself. In the scale of uh, complexity of challenge, where would you rank the current one versus what no. you've seen in your career? Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I, it's a nuanced ar argument in terms of the, the challenge is 5 out of 10 when we have faced 8 out of 10 kind of challenges. Right. Our preparedness and response to the challenge is 50% of what our preparedness and response to previous challenges. So although the challenges in, in, in recession and in other times were far bigger, but our preparedness and our response to them was much better. Uh, the challenge now is not that great, uh, but our response is a little lethargic. And... Uh we talked about the supply side, whereas in, we've talked about youngsters, students, uh, joinees, uh, those who are going up the ladder. So let's look at the other side. And you you've talked about, on, on more than once, you've talked about guts, you've talked about bravery, you've talked about taking the leap. So what should CEOs be doing? Or to put it differently, if I were to be observing a Infosys or a Wipro or a HCL from outside, what should I look out for? Or what should I expect that CEO to do, which would give me confidence that that company is marching into this new digital age in a, so in a, in a significant way. All the companies you mentioned are great companies, including, uh, you know, HCL, which is, I think, the greatest company. So <laughs> I, I don't think I have, an advice. Advice. I, have an, I have an advice for those CEOs because I'm an old, old, uh, old daddy. I've, you know, been outside uh, the industry for 10 years. I've been working on social change. So I, I would not give an advice. 
But here is here is what I would want you to think about. The new competition is coming from the Googles and Amazons and Microsoft the world when everything is moving digital and into their house. They are creating new smaller vendors in local communities which are offering those digital services to their customers, right? Watch that trend. And therefore, don't be focused on China, Vietnam, Philippines, or Eastern Europe. They are competition or, or, uh, or what's happening in Mexico, yes. But watch out for what these biggies are doing. These biggies are not only bringing in all the applications, all the infrastructure into their houses, and therefore they have what we call privileged access and exclusivity with their customers, but they are doing it not with the biggies, but with creating a lot of smaller ecosystem who they can have a sharper control on. If you remember what Microsoft did with operating system, is what potentially can happen with, with, uh, uh, with the services sector if you're not very careful. So I don't have an advice for them, but I would say that you need to redefine competition. Uh, the competition is going to, like Indian IT emerged, nobody believed Indian IT could compete with an IBM and HPs of the world, but it did and it took the market share away. Your competition is going to come from a completely, it's not going to come from a country. It's going to come from these bees and it's going to come in a way which you have not imagined and it's going to come from many small ecosystems which will become very difficult to compete because they'll be sharper, they'll be focused, they'll be local, their cost structures will be uh, will be lower and that will become very difficult to compete. So my, my emphasis would be redefine your competition and see what is your competition going to be and then your responses should be based on that. Right, and last question. So uh, you started the Sampark Foundation which uh, addresses education gaps and uh, it's been a while and you rolled it out to 76,000 schools now, the interventions. Tell us about where you are in that process and uh, what's next. In 2013, uh, me and my wife decided that we want to quit everything which we were doing and I quit HCL and said that let us take an opportunity to try and see if we can demonstrate large-scale social change in education. Uh, and bring design thinking and innovation to it. A lot of uh, uh, my partners from Harvard Business School and you know some people from uh, West Coast collaborated to create design thinking and create products which will ignite the classroom transaction uh, and make the job of the teacher easier. So we created math kits using an audio box. We created an English kit of, of creating an immersive experience of stories and Bollywood and songs and things like that. And now we've created what we call a smart, uh, smart program where we are converting a dumb school into what we call a smart school. All this for less than one dollar per child per annum. So today we are touching lives of one crore children uh, in one lakh nine thousand schools across eight states. And I mean, it's a very fulfilling uh, opportunity uh, for me because I'm getting a lot more. Yeah, we are me and my wife are funding this completely. We do not take any funds from the government, uh, state or center government. Uh, but this is very full, fulfilling. The message which I want to give through this challenge, because you have given me an opportunity, is some of you professionals who are looking at this and thinking about this, uh, there is a life outside IT. And that life is called India. India needs intellect. It doesn't need your money. There is enough money flowing around. It needs intellect. It needs design thinking. It needs solution. So all you guys who have been so successful in IT, especially in IT, uh, think about hanging your boats and doing something, you know, back for the country. Go to Jharkhand, go to Chhattisgarh, go to these tribal areas, which these days I travel. It's a very poor country. It needs your help. And it's not going to be only government who's responsible. We are all responsible and you can make a change. So go back to your village, go back to your town, apply innovation, apply design thinking, apply process, apply technology and make a change. And I think it will make you very happy compared to that million dollar bonus which you normally get. Right, uh, Mr. Nair, thank you so much. And that's a very nice and uh, a positive note to end on. Thank you once again for joining me. Thank you. Thank you so much. 